よ、石井さんは。Welcome back, everybody. Today we're discussing Shogun Episode Three. The episode begins with Yabushigi finishing his will, accompanied by his second in command and a solid attitude about what the day brings. He is marched to Toronaga's quarters, stripped of his sword, and brought to this dark room. Toronaga questions him, asking about the Society of Amida. It is an assassination organization sworn to the Buddha. Amida. I didn't catch this on my first watch, but the direct call out to the Buddhist faith makes me believe that Ochiba here is actually an assassin, or maybe even the leader of this covert organization. She had a line last episode about God being up this Catholic's ass, and it really is the only person that we know that rides for Buddha. It really makes me think that perhaps her and Toranaga looking at each other like this has something to do with that, and this grand scale scheme plot that has been going on behind the scenes that we have very little information about. Yabushigi resigns himself to death, looking out toward a rising sun and accepting that his time is over. Toranaga asks him what Lord Ishido offered, and he says that it was his seat on the council. Now, this could have happened off screen, but it definitely isn't shown, or this could just be a lie, knowing that they are already at odds. Yabushigi says that the seat doesn't interest him, and the Suruga province is actually what he is after. Toranaga spares him and gives him the task of escorting Lady Kiri and John to the fishing village that John first arrived. Arrived at called Ajiro. This is the land that Omi manages. If he can safely escort this party there, then the Saruga province belongs to him. They stand, they hold hands probably, and watch the morning sun break together as the conversation ends. We come to Father Martin talking to the black ship captain. He is basically grounding the ship on behalf of Toranaga. He says that Toranaga has requested additional paperwork to show their rates of exchange, but we know the true reason for this indefinite suspension is because he wants to find out more about their operation in Japan, about the secret Portuguese base that's in Macau. The captain talks a big game, demanding that they have the cards, they make the money, and they should demand to leave when they wish. But Toranaga has the say in what comes in or out of the country, and if they leave without getting the clearance, it could stop them from trading here altogether. He ends the conversation demanding that the black ship sails tonight, reminding them that he doesn't work for the church, he works for the crown. It shows a higher power struggle that probably turned what was truly holy intentions at first into the current culture that puts profits first. We see John getting treated for his injuries after the assassin cut him the night before. He calls him a warlock and wants to be bloodlet so that the foul blood does not poison him. Nobody here knows what that is, of course, and they talk about the assassin being a maid for several years and how the others may train their entire lives for a single kill. Now, that line right there is massive. It feels like Chekhov's gun, and it feels like we must see some major twist with someone being this dedicated assassin before the series is over. I think the obvious choice here is again going back to Ochiba. They talk about the price to have Toranaga assassinated being unbelievable, that very few would ever be able to see such amounts of wealth, which means that it must have only been one of the regents or one of the Catholic leaders, which John recommends that Mariko uh, considers heavily. The doctor brings up him needing to be pillowed to relieve some of the stress that he has, and John is quite taken back by it, though he doesn't say as much right now. Bontaro enters, demands things of Mariko, and then snaps at her when she questions why. Again, not the best dude. We then come to Fuji with the remains of her son and husband, a gift from her grandfather who tells her that Toranaga commands that she joins the little mini vacay they have to the fishing village. He brings up her father's swords, which we do learn have some pretty damning things like attached to them a little bit later on in a couple episodes, but he basically uses them to say it's time for her to continue his fight, that her father died for a greater cause and now it's time for her to do the same. Knowing what we know in the later episodes, this moment feels quite manipulative, though I won't say too much to avoid spoilers. Her lord commanded her to serve, and now it's time to serve. We then see all of Toranaga's men suited up and looking sharp. Truly, this armor must be some of the coolest armor ever created in human history. I watched a video once that explained the outside was really good at preventing slashing attacks, and then like a silk was worn underneath to help or prevent or cushion um, from piercing attacks, like arrows. It is just 
it, I just thought that was so cool. Also, it's beautiful. They discussed Toronaga staying behind, showing that mostly everybody had zero clue about what was about to happen. John is told to stay close to the litter along the journey, which seems like a terrible name to call a group of submissive women, or a really good name if, if they're down for that. Mariko's son comes forward, begs his mom not to leave, and then Bontaro, being the douche that he is, rips him away and demands that he is not a suckling child. It is... I mean, I, I actually love that line. Like, <laughs> I love that line. That is so hard. But, you know, not a good thing to do. Hiromatsu, very loud, very clearly, calls out to Lady Kiri. Um, it is... It's not exactly shown this way, but it it does feel like he's making a spectacle so that everyone knows who is going to be inside of this box um, because they're planning on switching them out and more people that know Lady Kiri is in that box, the better. Also keep an eye out for the person following Lady Kiri. That's Torinaga. It's so funny to me that this works, like his frame and even his walk was so perfectly feminine that nobody expected a thing. Lady Kiri says goodbye to the expecting mother of Lord Torinaga's child. They close the box and then Lord Ishido arrives. They demand to inspect the carts, citing that they must be given 24-hour notice before leaving so that he can say his goodbyes. It's a poorly disguised rule meant to ensure that Lord Ishido controls who can and cannot leave. Lord Toronaga knew this would happen as he agreed to the protocol, so this plan was needed to safely get out. Lord Ishido commands Josen to inspect the private quarters and Nagakado, who is Toronaga's son, steps up. He demands that they cannot just inspect their higher up's private chambers. The man laughs, looking at the fresh-faced boy with no battle experience. The boy is ready to brawl, and if it were not for Hiromatsu, he probably would have gotten that fight. Hiromatsu soothes things over and allows them to inspect the cabins. Lord Kiri tells Lord Ishido that there are too many assassins in Osaka, and he agrees. He then says that he heard that the engine was attacked last night. Now, we didn't see this information, like, get to him. So this may have been a slip on his part, revealing that he knew more than he should have, but it's not really addressed like that um, here or later, so... It just seems like he, he he knew. Somebody told him off screen. Lord Ishido is also not addressing the fact that the engine is leaving at all, which is kind of odd because on the surface he should be, since he just expedited his execution. His talk with Yabushigi did change his mind, and I think he wants to use him in a similar way, but it's interesting that he is not worried about, you know, this man not being in his custody any longer. Maybe it shows that he does trust Yabushigi to come you know, to come forth and, and give him back when the time is needed, but I don't know, it is kind of odd here. Shizu fakes the pregnancy starting early, and Lady Kiri slips away. Inside of the carriage is now Toranaga, and John is one of the only people aware of the switch. So, he keeps his mouth shut. They advance forward, and Yabushigi and Yozen have a private conversation about Yabushigi's loyalties. He assures Yozen where his heart is and wants him to remind his lord that he always keeps his promises. At this point, we still don't know if he is truly loyal to either of these men. John and Mariko talk about who knows, and we learn that Toranaga is famous for his trickery. It was an unexpected line, and it feels like it almost flies in the face of being an honest, forthcoming, honorable samurai. To fight battles like this instead of head-on could be seen as coward's play or enthetical to how leaders of this country should operate. But I think that that's kind of the point as Japan is in this transitional period. She says that Toranaga was six years old when his father traded him to a rival. He was a hostage. He learned that enemies were everywhere and friends nowhere. It's meant to be this big explanation about how he became so cunning, and it mirrors what the former Tycho said when he said that he wants his son to learn from him. But in reality, this is a sad and scary life. To truly believe this, and for this to be rare, is to be a paranoid mind amongst the comfortable. It's desperately hoping that you are protected more than you're hurt, and only seeing the attempts to hurt you. This is truly a lonely mindset, but it keeps you alive. We have another line about showing your true heart being a risk to your life, and Mariko says that if he is found, he and all of them will be killed. It's a sharp remark that leads directly to the point in which they could be discovered. Nobody reacts, as again, this culture does not permit that. They have no authority to stop this inspection, so they don't believe that they can. In a land where every misaction is punishment and every punishment is death, Nobody dares take action, worrying that their action would be missed. 
And I think that that's where John comes in with a white boy attitude. He plays the part of an outraged foreigner, demanding the inspection of a woman's private quarters to be outrageous. It is a bold move, but that's what we like about him. That's why his men like him. He did what couldn't be done in bold things like this, or hopefully would get him out of here as well. This part was also so funny, like him coming out of nowhere and saying that he's a silly little man and insulting his, his ponytail. 10 out of 10. Oh my God, that was so good. Yozin, who does have authority here as Lord Ishido's general, demands an end to the buffoonery, and they continue on their way, very, very luckily. They travel until it's nighttime and share a conversation about the women of England. They are not placed on a pedestal like he claimed moments before. It's a good remark to show that he doesn't think that England is all that. He isn't here because he believes his land is better and this place needs to learn from it. He is humbly from a place of whores. I love that sentiment. They talk about the moment of the clouds and the rain, the birds and the bees. She brings up the concept that climaxing is as close to heaven as one can actually get until they die. It's a sentiment that many cultures have formed in some kind of way, and I think it, I think it makes sense. Um, I love that idea. We are here to reproduce our bodies, literally engineered by previous generations to do the thing that feels good. The bodies that felt best doing it survived until the majority of us consider this literally the best feeling in the world. Think about your mother and your father and their mother and their father and their mother and their father. Next time you're deep in that thick cloud of fog and it starts to rain because that's as close to heaven as you can get. They talk about having children and before the conversation could really begin, Arrows rain from higher ground. This scene was pretty badass. Tornaga has to flee after arrows target his carriage, and Nagakado and Bantaro both see him exit. They realize it's the Christians coming after the engine, and then we see Lord Kiyama himself. He doesn't care that Lord Ishido's men are down there, but the thing that is most interesting to me is from the last episode. You see, Lord Kiyama is taking things into his own hands after the Anjin was being moved against his wishes. He wanted Lord Ishido to execute him, and clearly now his men are helping him move and not do as he and the other regents requested. But we get the scene where Kiyama is telling the father he will carry the burden for them, and the very next scene is the assassination attempt. In filmmaking, this sequential ordering, you know, kind of creates a correlation means causation illusion. They want us to believe that Kiyama is responsible for the assassination attempt, but the assassination attempt is the reason that they were able to flee at all. What if Kiyama's action for the church was this and not the assassination, meaning maybe Toranaga was responsible and she gave her life in service to her Lord? The only thing that doesn't really align with this theory is her painful death. If he did command her to give her life so that they could have the conditions to escape, he, I think, probably would have quickly beheaded her just so it was as painless as possible. You know, that seems like the honorable thing to do, but overall it's just a theory. Back in the story, however, we have some expert sword fighting and Lord Ishido's men discovering Toranaga. Now, they believe that this ambush was their doing and everything is somehow more chaotic. The father-son fighting scene was great, made better by knowing that Hiroyuki Sonata, the you know actor behind Toranaga, has been using a sword since he was a little boy and his father studied kendo. It is awesome. Seeing him dispatching opponents in any piece of fiction will never get old. Mirko jumps into action, picking up a blade and fighting alongside with John. This entire scene was just so badass. It makes me really excited for, you know, the act three, the finale battles, like everything that's coming towards the end of the show. Um, and this scene ends with Bontaro demanding that they run ahead and they will continue fighting. They make it to the harbor and sure enough, John sees a friend, maybe his only. He spots the black ship for the first time and they set off, making their way to Toranaga's private vessel. As they get further away from the shore, the city comes to life trying to catch them, and we see Bontaro running through the streets, casting arrows back at his attackers, and finally being pushed to this dock. He slices and dices three attackers and then realizes that he's out of room. His lord has escaped, and he takes a knee knowing that his service is done. It's truly such a touching moment. It's one of those moments where a man just, it's time to be a man. Lord Toranaga bows to show his respect and gives thanks for his sacrifice. Bantaro fights back tears as he looks at his woman and then charges into hell with a forged blade. It's absolutely stunning. It made me cry for this piece of trash and then the fragility of life in general. This is one of the best scenes in the series. I love this moment. 
They make it to the boat, and then John spots a sea covered in fishing boats, another trap set by Kiyama. They discuss it being impossible to pass in a smaller vessel, and then we see Lord Ishido learning that Yabushigi betrayed them, and questioning if the men covering the harbor were Lord Kiyama's men. He is furious. They make the plan to board the black ship, where conveniently we learn that the captain intends to leave no matter what, permission or not. Rodriguez comes back into the picture, alerting them of the approaching ship. Back on the deck, he shouts for John, and they have a nice back and forth insulting each other's mothers as a polite greeting. You know, boys being boys. Torinaga requests an escort, and in exchange, the black ship can leave. The captain, perfectly ignorant or arrogant to respect the man who should be revered, demands that this is not enough. Instead, he takes a bribe of 10,000 tail silver coins, which he can use to invest in the silk trade, and the captain can keep half of the profit. He also tells the father that they can set up another church. I think both of these are just nonsense promises that he does not really feel like he has to keep because these people are trying to pull one over on him. Also, the people not giving him free aid in his time of need. Like, fuck him, right? I also think the investment is a way for him to determine how much they are actually making as the profits were a point of contention that he was wanting to revisit last episode with the father. I doubt this will come up later because I think he won't really care about any of these promises once he uncovers the secret bases and the and the hidden actions by the church, um, and he's probably just going to have them all killed. But I think even these bribes had ulterior motives. He doesn't want to just give this man silver, right? He's not just buying this 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 passage. He gives it to him to invest, and then he can have half of the profit. It feels like he's trying to catch some misalignment or discrepancy in how much everybody is actually making in this arrangement. Now, let's also not just pass over the church, because a church in Edo, which is the city that Toranaga resides over, is quite a big deal. He offers this in exchange for help with Kiyama and Ono. He wants to bribe the Christian lords to his side, and the father outright says that this is against the faith, with a giant asterisk that shows he is still considering it. The only condition for Toranaga to have safe passage is that John cannot board the ship. It's a shocking reveal, which does make sense, but even Toranaga is not happy. He does eventually concede, and John is left behind on Toranaga's boat. It is quite shocking to me that he would allow this, after all that he's been through, but it kind of sets the stage for John to once again be able to prove himself. John watches the men and his hope for survival sail away, and then reminds himself that he's no bitch and rallies the men to row. He takes the big stick and, much like Carrie Underwood, hopes that God is with him in this moment. He yells for the men to go faster, then yells insults at Rodriguez. It's lovely, and exactly what it means to have guy friends. They essentially race each other out of the harbor, John using the closeness of the ship to protect his right flank. They try to run him into the rocks, but he narrowly escapes. As someone who has played Sea of Thieves before, I think he probably could have done it better, but either way, it worked. I was kind of upset that none of the boats in the harbor, like, actually mattered. You know, nobody got shot, fire arrows didn't rain through the sky, nothing ignited the giant sails on either one of these ships. At the end of the encounter, like, honestly, the black ship was just the, the biggest obstacle for them. But it did give John another moment to prove himself, and it showed us how irrational the captain of the black ship can be, also how rational Rodriguez is, and that he isn't actually a monster. He ultimately does let him pass, fearing the damage to the hull, which is somewhat true, but I think, honestly, Rodriguez just wanted him to escape. He kind of admires him, or was paying back the debt of saving him from drowning. Tornaga leaves the black ship and rejoins John on the galley, and we return to the Council of Regents. He is upset that there was violence in his city ordered by one of his fellow regents without his consent or knowledge, and they pretend that it was bandits. The seating in the scene is also interesting. We see the two Christian lords sitting across from Sigiyama and Ishido, like the showrunners were trying to show us the divide amongst these regents. Lord Ishido blames them either way, because if they would have voted out Toranaga, they could have just done away and been, been done with this mess already. But they didn't. They wanted the engine killed first, and it has led to everything that has happened. Then in walks a legend. Hiromatsu comes in dressed in his Sunday best. He extends a letter from Toranaga saying that he resigns from the council. It's a giant fuck you to the people that see right through this insult, and oh my god, I love seeing this. It is 
It is the breaking of the formalities. It's a tiny bit less proper than it should be and closer to him outright saying, you know, screw you all. Your pieces of trash were trying to overthrow the former Tycho's legacy. It doesn't matter to them because ultimately they still intend to vote him out for to none. Hiramatsu, barely able to hold back his laughter, delivers the bad news and reminds them that any vote requires five total votes. It is outstanding. Standing. Oh my god, it was so good. We then come to Toronaga's galley, and we can see just how many people they have rowing. It is a great amount, far more than we've actually seen on the ship. They plan to return to Edo, and Nagakado will be dropped off with Yabushigi to Ajiro, which he will then, you know, be there to help train this new regiment. Nagakado openly acknowledges that Yabushigi is conspiring with Ishido and does not understand why Toronaga doesn't trust him enough to handle the regiment by himself. Toronaga says that he is still playing a game of friends and enemies while he only has himself in this life. It's another reinforcement of this mindset that he used to stay alive, that he needed to stay alive and gather the power and respect that he has now. But it's a hard lesson to learn, and perhaps it is an impossible lesson to teach without the trauma that it actually took to learn, but he really does want his son to know how valuable it is to not strike your enemies when you know that they're enemies. If you can smile and keep the peace, that is invaluable. Even if they conspire against you openly, you can then conspire against them quietly. In terms of a father-son relationship, though, I feel for this man. He is going through it. Um, he really, it just seems like he wants a pat on the back and he's not getting that. And it is kind of making him, you know, do irrational things. Um, which does happen a little bit later. No spoilers. Um, I'm sure that Toronaga did have worse. So his like standard of what it means to be a good father is kind of fucked. Um, you know, like his father figure was the one who sent him to be a hostage, like in his father's place and to keep his father's peace. Um, and I think that that is just, it, it's hard, right? Being a father, being a son, it's hard, but maybe he'll break the cycle. I don't know. John and Mariko talk about the weather, and I knew right away that these people were about to smash. Now that Bontaro was killed, she perhaps has another chance to find love, or at least a good pillowing. They talk about John's kids being left behind, just further reassurance that there are no good fathers in this story, and his attraction to the horizon, the open sea, and the endless possibility that is just out of sight. It is a beautiful thought about true freedom and hope, no thinking of tomorrow or yesterday, just living in the moment and starving to death and getting scurvy. Toronaga approaches and thanks him for his bravery and reveals the journals that would prove he is a pirate and condemned to die. But Toronaga is actually showing that he is kind of acting in good faith. He is revealing the cards that he has against John and saying that it will take some time before these are translated. It is an opportunity for him to prove himself and escape this fate. John is given a task of training a regiment to fight for Toranaga, and after almost continuing to defend himself from, from being a pirate, he accepts his role for Toranaga. He wants his ship and his men freed in exchange, and Toranaga doesn't exactly agree, but gives words to Yabushigi and Nagakado that they are to learn everything that this barbarian has to teach them in terms of fighting. To celebrate John becoming a vessel of Toranaga's, he's given a name, and that is Hatamoto. John, a little taken back that another grown man is naming him right now, politely accepts the custom that he is most unfamiliar with. He replies in Japanese, thank you. It's showing that John is learning, becoming more respectful of their customs, more willing to serve. After giving John a name, Toranaga wants to go for a little swim with John. See, Toranaga wants to learn how to dive from a real pirate, which in terms of legacy and story would make tales of his life just even grander, even better, make the story that much more exciting, something that means a great deal to them and myself as well. I love doing things just to say that I've done those things. Even like if I learned to die from a pirate, oh my God, I would never stop talking about that, right? Like, oh my God. The diving exercise in and of itself is also kind of a training for John. He shows the man how to dive, very willing and providing all of the information he could right away. Toranaga then says again, and again, and again, and again. The point is to show John his purpose here, to show John how he must serve when he is asked to serve. Also, John could get it. Look at this man. 
Finally, Toranaga disrobes and asks John to race. The lighting of this scene is changing throughout the encounter, finally displaying this moment like it is basked in the light of heaven. I think it's meant to again highlight the story that is being created here. John is racing Toranaga of Edo, descendants of the last shogunite, Minowara blood, and the honor that comes with treating him as a peer really should not be taken lightly. He is revered, and truly, Hiroyuki Sonata being this divine figure, it makes me so happy. Good God, I love I love seeing this man in anything. They begin their race, all struck eyes watching as they descend into the water, and we never learn who wins. And it's because it's not important. What is important is the story that led to the point in which these two men could race, away from the chaos of yesterday or tomorrow. But with that, we come to the end of the video. Special thank you to everybody over on Patreon. Please do check that out if you wish to support this channel. You really don't get any special privileges by joining, but it is the best way to financially support this single person channel. The next best way is just by subscribing and it is free. We have been fluctuating around the 48K to 50K range for the past couple of years, and it is time to move past that. My goal this year is 100,000. I'm going for that play button. I'm going to be shifting into overdrive, more videos, more content. I'm also streaming over on Twitch if you would like to check that out. That is also HacksDogma at Twitch.com. Your comments, your likes, and watch time will increase my discoverability, and then everything else is left to me to get new subscribers. I appreciate those that I see every single week adding to this growth that engage me on Twitch, truly. Truly, that makes me feel so good. Thank you for being here. I really wish I could give more to show my gratitude, but right now I can offer a, a humble thank you. Much love, everybody, and I cannot wait to talk to you all again soon.